In our time, right across the planet, the past is receding from us at an ever faster rate. And that's especially so here in China. But the traveler searching for the meaning of China's ancient culture can still find it in China's present. For here, running under the surface, are deep currents still shared by all Chinese people. And among them is one great stream that has sustained the Chinese across the ages, their poetry. China has the oldest living tradition of poetry in the world, more than 3,000 years old, older than Homer's Iliad and Odyssey. And for the Chinese, poets have always been the ones who most truthfully expressed the feelings of the people. And to the Chinese, their greatest poet is Du Fu. Du Fu lived in the 8th century, the age of Beowulf in Britain. It was the Tang Dynasty, a time of extraordinary cultural accomplishment that ended in horrendous warfare and the death of millions. And out of that suffering, Du Fu created his art. Du Fu belongs to a very special category. We have Dante, Shakespeare, and Du Fu. These poets create the very values by which poetry is judged. In the East, he's one of the immortals. In the West, few people have even heard of him. This is a journey in the footsteps of China's greatest poet. Fu was born into China's greatest epoch, the Tang Dynasty. At the time of his birth, the Tang had ruled for a century from their capital, Shang'an, today's Xi'an. It was the greatest city on earth, with more than a million people. Rich, powerful, and open to the world, for the Chinese, that time was their golden age. catalyst for it all was the Silk Road, along which people, goods and ideas flowed from India, Iran and Central Asia into the crowded streets of the capital. The Tang was a cosmopolitan empire of many cultures and languages. In its markets you could find a dazzling mix of foreign fashions and food, Persian pistachios and the golden peaches of Samarkand. Very, very good. <laughs> and Dufu's extraordinary life story would be entwined forever with the tale of this city and the fate of Tang China itself. Only a year after Dufu was born, a new emperor came to the dragon throne, Xuanzong, who was nicknamed the Brilliant. The emperor would oversee China's most glorious period of culture and, above all, its greatest age of poetry. And for the Chinese people, it's poetry which gives the truest history of the human heart. The 同时，这个记录还把他个人生活史和个人的精神史也记录在了诗篇当中。The Du family were an old upper middle class clan of officials and poets. In imperial China, the two went together. You couldn't be a Mandarin without proving your literary skills. The family house is long gone. This is all that's left. 
but tradition says that he was born here in this room. His mother died when he was an infant and he was brought up by his aunt whom he adored. And that brings us to a first mysterious story. When he was a baby, this region was struck by plague and people were dying everywhere. And one day, a sorceress, a shamaness, came to the house and looked in the bedroom. And two babies were asleep in the room, the son of the aunt and little Dufu. And the sorceress prophesied that only one of these children would survive. And the child had to be sleeping in the southeast corner of the room. And the aunt took her child out of that corner and put Dufu there. And for that reason, says Dufu, my aunt's son died and I lived. So maybe, even as a child, he felt as if he had the mark of destiny on him. More than 1,400 of his poems survive a uniquely intimate autobiography. Years later, as an old man, he wrote the story of his childhood and youth in a poem spoken by Ian McKellen. When I was still only in my seventh year, my mind was already full of heroic deeds. My first poem was about the phoenix, the harbinger of a sagacious reign, a new age of wisdom. When I was in my ninth year, I'd already written enough poems to fill a satchel. At 14, I first began to read my poems in public. The literary masters compared me to the great writers of the past. I was temperamental, and I was already over-fond of wine. I needed it to soften an uncompromising hatred of wickedness and hypocrisy. I associated only with wise old greyheads. Exhilarated by wine, we cast our glances over the entire universe and all vulgar worldliness dwindled into oblivion. I find that portrait of the artist as a young man, written by the older Dufu, really authentic. He obviously felt, even by the age of 14, that he was different from his schoolmates and his contemporaries. Um, maybe also already looking at the world as it ought to be rather than as it actually is. And as for his early inspirations, over 50 years later, he tells a story from his childhood. How, as a five-year-old boy, he was taken to see a great dancer and was overwhelmed by her magic. I remember when I was still a child, aged five, I saw the famous dancer Kung Sun perform the sword dance. Watching her, you felt heaven struggling against the earth. When she bent back, you saw nine suns falling, shot down by Yi, the god of archers. When she leapt, you imagined gods astride flying dragons in the clouds. When she advanced, you expected thunder and lightning from a gathering storm. When she stopped, you saw the soft light over a vast, calm sea. For Dufu, it was an unforgettable image of creative freedom and passion, in which the dance became a metaphor for all art, whether calligraphy, painting or poetry. In his late teens, the family were rich enough to allow him to go traveling. China then was at the height of its glory under the brilliant emperor. Those days, Dufu wrote, rice was succulent, 
the granaries were full, and not a robber on the road in all the nine provinces of China. No other civilization in the world was so refined or so cultured. Travelling across the empire, Du Fu gathered stories, visiting the legendary sites of heroes and dragons, immersing himself in China's ancient traditions. Like any tourist today, he admired the famous monuments, the great Buddhas of long men, he wrote, in their giant gorge cutting through the countryside, where every vista reveals gold and silver Buddha temples. But for Dufu, there was one special place of pilgrimage, Chufu the birthplace of the philosopher Confucius. Born over a thousand years before Dufu's day, Confucius had shaped the core values of Chinese civilization. For him, the main goal of life is social harmony and stability under a virtuous ruler. And each person has a role to play in helping the emperor achieve that common good. Teachings of Confucius were Dufu's guiding principles all his life, virtue, benevolence, service to the state. In a sense, you could say that, like much of the Chinese political tradition from ancient times, even to today, his thought was utopian. So he went to the capital, Shang'an, today's Xi'an expecting to become a government official. It was his chance to serve the brilliant emperor and help continue the new age of wisdom. Chang'an, the city of peace, along with Constantinople and Baghdad, it was a world city in the 8th century, the symbol of all that human civilization had to offer. And this place had a a powerful presence in Dufu's imagination all his life. It was the dream of success and power and fame, which one day he hoped he would achieve. And in his early 20s, he came here to sit the imperial examinations, confident that a glittering career lay ahead of him. In the prime of life, I was sent by my home prefecture to sit the state examinations. I feared no rival among the competing scholars, nor any difficult questions that might be put to me. I thought, of course, that I was extraordinary and should immediately climb to the top and restore the purity of culture and civilization. But unfortunately, the Board of Examinations thought otherwise. They failed me. All my hopes were shattered. Why does he fail, do you think? Yeah, it's the most important question. Mm -hmm. Many scholars are discussing about this. I think the most important reason is that the most important thing is the most important thing is the most important thing is that 他参加科举考试那一年的这个科举考试的一个风波当中，那么这次风波影响到那一年参加考试的很多考生，杜甫不幸被卷进去了，这个恐怕和他参加考试的个人才能关系不是很大。This is the first explanation. Yeah. Mm, there are a second one. Right. <laughs> 第二个是比较通常的解释，就是。杜甫他写诗的才能和参加科举考试写文章的才能是不匹配的，那么他主要才能在于写诗。Too much of a poet and not enough of a bureaucrat. That would be his problem. The examinations were the path to wealth and status, and exam failure 
cut him loose from the career ladder. So for a while he wandered, picking up jobs where he could and hating himself for living on the coattails of the rich. The next few years, I played and roamed. In the spring, I sang on the terraces where the poets competed. Summer, I hunted among the green hills. In the winter, I whistled for the falcons in the purple oak forests, chased wild beasts on cloud and snow ridge. I trailed my hems wherever sweet ale was served and drank myself sick. Then, when he was about 30, came the meeting that changed his life with the poet Li Bai. Li Bai was the great poet of the time. Du Fu calls him the star of the Golden Gate. Charismatic, drunkard, brawler, frequenter of the blue houses, as the Chinese call them. He'd killed men in fights. But he was a brilliant, innovative, scintillating poet and Du Fu fell under his spell. What wonderful verses he writes, said Du Fu. I love him like a brother. Those nights we traveled, we slept under the same quilt, and every day we walked together, hand in hand. We didn't think about jobs in the government. We only thought of otherworldly things. Li Bai was Du Fu's most important creative relationship. Li For a time, the friendship was close, at least from Du Fu's side. But then they split up, and he never saw Li Bai again, although he still dreamed of him. Separation by death, in the end, you get over. Separation in life is a continuing grief. No word from you, old friend, but you've been in my dreams, as if you know how much I miss you. I feel as if you are no longer mortal. The distance between us is so great. The waters are deep. The waves are wide. Don't let the river gods take you. It was an eerie premonition. For Li Bai would drown on a drunken boating trip. But he showed Du Fu what poetry could be. It's amazing, isn't it? China's two greatest poets lived at the same time and knew each other. What effect did that relationship have on Du Fu, do you think? Li, Li Bo or Li Bai, Li Bo was the old pronunciation, uh, had a, 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 a character that was very charismatic. A lot of people were attracted to him. And, and, and Du Fu worshipped him. But his poetry is not at all like that of Li Bai's. There's almost Dionysian versus Apollonian, aren't yeah, they? Exactly. Which say in yes, Greek. Yes. Tell us, tell us about the difference. Libor was very keen on ability to be at one with nature, and Dufu was much more concerned with people and to people, and how you must live uh, according to Confucianism, and particularly you had to be loyal to your emperor, or to the leader you chose, at any rate. The 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 leadership was very important to Confucianism. And very important to Du Fu. Still hoping to serve the empire, he settled in the capital. He failed the exams again, but he kept writing. And through a friend, he sent some of his work directly to the emperor, here at the Daming Palace. And to his astonishment, the emperor read them and summoned him. The son of heaven summoned me to his presence, he says. And the officials came in their carriages 
and their state robes. And I was amazed. In a single day, my reputation had become brilliant. So at last, he had a job at court. His meager stipend enabled him to marry and start a family. But the job was a dead end, and he soon became disillusioned. I've no role at all in court discussions, he wrote. Just one of thousands who attended every whim of the Son of Heaven. Dufu did try to give him the civil service, but he never actually quite fitted in. And you can understand why. He was too honest a character. Mm. He, he wouldn't uh, bow to whatever he, he had to. And however much he wanted to be a, a very important person who could influence the emperor, in fact, he, he was completely helpless. The brilliant emperor was in his 60s now. Once a model of enlightened rule, he'd become negligent, infatuated with his concubine Yang, rewarding her family and promoting corrupt ministers. For Dufu, the closer he got to the throne, the clearer he saw the reality of power. It was a time when the powerful indulged in murder and plunder. The military used up the tax grain in the stores, the imperial fighting cocks had to be fed. Many warnings could have been obtained from history about why a dynasty falls. Through all of Chinese history, the problem has been the same. The country is so big that if its rulers lose their grip, things fall apart. And it was at this point that Dufu had a disturbing experience, what almost sounds like a sudden seizure. Dufu came with three friends here to the Wild Goose Pagoda in Xi'an. They went inside and climbed up to the top to take the view at sunset. But when he looked out, Dufu was seized by a kind of existential panic. The mountains of the north began to dissolve. The Wei River disappeared. And then the imperial city itself vanished in a kind of haze. And the wild geese flew away. The empire now went into crisis. Frontier wars had led to higher taxes mass conscription hit the poor. With social unrest growing, the nation was paralyzed by rains and floods, with half the capital underwater. As food ran out in the city, Dufu sent his family into the countryside, here to the village of Fengxian. But the rains were relentless. Then the harvest failed, and famine followed. Dufu's Confucian dream was unravelling. In winter 755, desperate to make sure his family was safe, he got leave and set off to join them in Fengxian. I set out a lone traveller at midnight, fingers too cold to tie my broken belt. At dawn, I passed the Imperial Palace. Here, at the hot springs, the emperor entertains his court, and music echoes around the hills. Only the rich and powerful may bathe here, but the silk they wear was woven by poor people, women whose husbands are beaten for their taxes. The halls are full of ladies as fair as goddesses, the scent of perfume moves with each captivating figure clothed in the warm furs of sable. Entertained with the finest music, fed with camel hump soup and oranges ripened in the frost. Behind the red lacquered gates, wine is left to sour, meat to rot. 
Outside the gates lie the bones of the frozen and the starved. But when Dufu got to the village, his worst fears had come true. When I reached home, I heard wailing in the house. My infant child had died of hunger. I am ashamed of being a father, so poor that I caused my son to die for lack of food. And I am one of the privileged. If my life is so bitter, then how much worse is the life of the common people? worse was to come. In mid-December 755, a huge rebellion broke out, led by the renegade general An Lu Shan. With an army of a quarter of a million men, he marched on the capital. 755 is the date I always tell everybody, when the whole of China collapsed. I think the rebellion floored the empire completely. The emperor resigned and his son took over and there was a lot of infighting. The country was completely let, let go of and there was a huge drive for recruitment of soldiers on either side. And it was very hard for ordinary people to, to live and to survive. The crisis lasted eight years. The destruction and loss of life was huge. Tang government censuses suggest as many as 30 million people were displaced, killed in war, or died of famine. It was as deadly as the First World War. And from this time, Dufu's poetry conjures images from later Chinese history, when order breaks down and chaos rises like a storm. As the rebels closed in on the capital, Dufu and his family took to the road, heading north to escape the fighting. I remember when we first fled the rebels, hurrying north over dangerous trails, the whole family trudging endlessly, begging without shame from the people we met. We walked for 10 days, holding hands, half in rain and thunder, through the mud, we pulled each other on. Searching the horizon for a wisp of smoke that might lead us to a safe shelter. The war was the turning point in Dufu's life and the great divide in his poetry. Now he knew what it meant to be, as Shakespeare would put it, a poor, unaccommodated man. Tabuzai the capital fell to An Lushan's army. The new emperor and his court had fled south, but when Dufu tried to join them, he was captured on the road by the rebels. Too lowly to warrant execution, he was taken as a captive to the capital, once more separated from his family. Among the poems he wrote then were famous verses to his wife. The moon shines in Fuzhou tonight. In her chamber, she watches alone. Her cloud-like hair is sweet with mist, her jade arms cold in the clear moonlight. When shall we lean in the empty window together in brightness? Our tears dried up. He spent that winter and the following spring doing forced labor as a porter under rebel rule in the ruined capital. But he was still writing poetry. 
Well, I think you identify with him much more than before because you see him as a helpless pawn in the way of uh, the great events that are happening all around him. He couldn't help writing. Mm. He had to write to, to mm. say all the things he wanted mm. to say. And uh, it, I think it was at this, this time that his art really grows to be uh, more than just an ordinary person. He becomes a great poet through, yes. through the experience of war and yes. suffering, yes, would you indeed. say? Yeah. I think without the Andrushan, we wouldn't have Dufu as, as we know him now. It was at this time that Dufu wrote one of his most celebrated poems, still known to all Chinese people today. The state is destroyed, but the country remains. In the city, in spring, grass and weeds grow everywhere. Grieving for the times, even the blossoms sheds tears. Beacon fires have been burning for three months now. A letter from home would be worth 10,000 in gold. Eventually, Dufu escaped through the rebel lines and was reunited with his family. And then in winter 759, driven by starvation, they headed out west to Qinzhou, today's Tianxue. And in midwinter, as the war came closer, they turned south, a terrible journey over the forbidding mountainous divide of central China, down to Sichuan and the city of Chengdu. You can feel his relief to be down south. Suddenly, I'm under a new corner of the sky, he wrote. Among the mulberries and elms, the sun shines on my traveller's clothes. The city is bustling, full of new people, the splendid houses, the trees. Though I miss my home, it's a beautiful place. Here in Chengdu, an old friend gave him a plot of land outside the town. It was a heavenly spot and he built himself a thatched cottage. Ever since, it's been China's most famous place of literary pilgrimage, as each dynasty has reimagined Dufu in its own way. Dufu has evolved to be the great poet, no matter which dynasty he's been in, for 1,200 years. His poetry reflects an experience and transforms it, and so this becomes part of the vocabulary. Uh, emotional vocabulary of the culture. And today, poetry lovers, young and old, come here from all over China. So she likes Dufu already. Yeah? In the garden, I met one Dufu fan who'd started very young indeed. So that was very good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. That's wonderful. So why do the Chinese people love Dufu still so much? Well, I, I think in the recent years, Dufu uh, started to be famous again because of the internet. Especially wow. the young people, uh, if you travel abroad, and uh, you can start feeling proud of being a Chinese and uh, kind of homesick, want to go back home. His is so you have been to this place before? Oh, often. Often. Very often. Yeah. Perhaps at least a month. Once a month you come. Why is Dufu so important to you? He wrote many poets to express mm. feelings of the general people, the ordinary common people, especially for the poor people. Especially for the poor. Poor people.
Here, outside the city, there are few worldly affairs. Beside us, there is a clear stream to dispel a stranger's grief. Clouds of dragonflies hover, rising and falling. A pair of ducks dive and swim together. I have chosen a place to grow old in. Far from the capital, I have become a farmer. On a long summer day, everything has a secret beauty. The swallows in the roof come and go as they please. My wife makes a chessboard by painting paper. My boys make fish hooks by bending needles. A man who is often sick needs medicine. What else should an ordinary person seek? Du Fu has always been portrayed as a Confucian hero. But so many of his poems are about ordinary people and the simple joys of life. The Chinese critics of the Song Dynasty said he never for a moment forgot the empire and the suffering people. I beg to differ. He, when he was having a good meal, he forgot completely about the empire. He concentrated entirely on the meal. He wrote more poems on food than any poet before him. And there's a sensuality in that, which is missing in Confucian hero story. In Chengdu, he became a poet farmer, finding beauty in nature and in the intimacy of the everyday. Du Fu writes about it as if it were an idyll. But at the same time, he says, I keep finding myself grieving bitterly. And to understand why, maybe an analogy from Western culture is helpful. Right in the middle of the First World War, Sigmund Freud wrote an essay on grieving in which he says that one may grieve as intensely for an ideal or a civilization as for a loved one. And I think that's what Dufu is experiencing, a cultural sorrow. In the face of total war, all the certainties of the old world had gone. In spring 762, with the war still raging, the new emperor died. Seizing their moment, the Tibetans launched a massive raid into western China. As their armies advanced in the west and the rebels ravaged the north, Du Fu took to the road again, now in increasingly bad health. The life of a poor refugee had taken its toll. He headed down to the Yangtze, hoping to find a way out on the one safe route still open, the river. The road ahead is blurred and lost, he wrote. Where is the capital now? He would never see it again. So now we follow his track onwards on what the Chinese call the Great River. Leaving the heartland of China behind, he heads east on the Yangtze, still a great artery of communication and commerce as it was in his time. Right, a little glimpse of the old-fashioned travel on the River Yangtze. In the Tang Dynasty, they say thousands of ships were going up and down every day, and the nation would come to a halt if the ships stopped. Over the next few months, he sails 400 miles downriver to Quezhou, today's Baidi Chung. Down here, Du Fu found himself outside the civilization he knew. The indigenous people spoke a completely different dialect. It was a new world to him, physically and mentally.
And this is where he stopped, the entrance to the Yangtze Gorges. As a landscape, it could hardly be more different from the, the beautiful gardens of the thatched cottage in Chengdu. Here, the giant gorges, the great river, as powerful as an ocean, as Du Fu said. And he got himself a little farmstead up in the hills, grew vegetables, kept chickens, and he wrote and wrote every day in an incredible outpouring of poetry, hundreds of poems. It was clear now that his dream of being the emperor's minister and having his picture hung in the unicorn hall would never be fulfilled. The autumn wastes are each day wilder. Cold in the river, the blue sky stirs. I have moored my boat to the well-roped star of the barbarians. My ambition was to be seen in the unicorn hall. But my years decline. On the great river, autumn is soon in spate. In the empty gorge, the night is full of noises. Long wanderings will be my fate, he wrote. But he wasn't afraid, for as another exiled Dante would say, our fate cannot be taken from us, it is a gift. And in the gorges, though at great cost to himself, Dufu's gift was creative and imaginative freedom. I can't imagine a more interesting place to be stuck. It was a world of immense motion and change and transformation. And the language was forced to do things you didn't think the Chinese language could ever do. Here is art struggling with the contingency of the everyday and trying to make sense of it. And what you feel too here in the deep gorges is the power of nature the great river, the crushed strata of rocks towering above you. Chinese scientists in the Tang Dynasty, unlike people in the West, knew very well that the earth was very, very old. And maybe living among these kind of landscapes gave a great nature poet another handle on the relationship between human beings and time and the cosmos. In the evening of the year, yin and yang hurry the shortening daylight. On the sky's edge, frost and snow clear in the cold of night. In the three gorges, the river of stars, reflection stirring, shaking, weeping in the wilderness. How many families know of war? loss. The people's songs rise from fishermen and woodcutters, tales of sleeping dragon and leaping horse, the old heroes who have turned to dust. All word of events in the human world lost in these vast silent spaces. Closer now to his mentor Li Bai's love of nature, Du Fu had come to terms with the limits of human action in the face of the immensity of nature and time. His poems from the gorges have influenced Chinese poets ever since, and in the West, artists from the modernists to Pink Floyd. They are the greatest poems in the Chinese language. They do what could not have been imagined beforehand. They do things that people try to do again later, but never could quite do. It was the summa, the, the medieval Chinese thought and poetry. He is a protean mind. And when you see that mind at work, it's a kind of joy.
Dufu lived here for two years, the last period of his life when he had a settled abode. He had some kind of social life, looking after his poor neighbours, and he got invites to functions in town. And one night, something extraordinary happened. He went to a concert that triggered perhaps his most intense childhood memory from 50 years before. On November the 15th, 767, I saw the Lady Li from Lin Ying perform the sword dance. Marveling at her agility, I asked who her teacher was. I'm a pupil of Kung Sun, she said. And I remembered that day when I was still a child. Since then, more than 50 years have passed so fast, like the turning of a palm. Stormy waves of war have enfolded our royal house in gloom. The pupils of the Peach Garden, the Royal Dance School, have scattered like disappearing mist. The brilliant feasts, the music and the songs have ended. And I am now an old man who does not know where he is going. Dufu saw that through her pupil, Lady Gongsun's art had lived on. But what of him? Would his art survive? In spring 768, Dufu gave his cottage to a neighbor and moved on. We don't know why. I've given up on official service, he wrote. Blown by the winds, I'm like a seagull circling between heaven and earth. He's just a wanderer, traveling along the river uh, with his wife and kids, a couple of servants and a boatman, with all their worldly goods on their little boat and the precious scrolls of his poems. Over the next year, they went on down river and then turned south across Dongting Lake till they reached the city of Tanzhou, today's Changsha. Away from the conflicts in the north, for now Changsha was a safe haven, like Casablanca after the fall of France in World War II. So that pavilion's built on the spot where Dufu's supposed to have stayed. He left the boat on the shore and rented a room upstairs in one of the tenements, looking over the fisherman's market just outside of town. For so long I've had no fixed abode, he wrote. My children have grown up on the road. In every place I've left a house and a garden. But Changsha offered a fresh start. Today at Dufu's Pavilion, Changsha locals exercise, sing and dance and play music. First thing in the morning and again after work. And here Dufu's mood lifted. What he found here was a refugee community of artists, musicians and poets some of whom he'd known in the north. And he stayed here for that winter, regaining his strength. For Professor Yang Yu, it was a creative period for Du Fu, even though his life was still hard. He Dufu's
His revived spirits came in part from collaborating with other artists. Together they set his poems to music, and Professor Young and her students are trying to work out how the poems might have sounded on tongue instruments. In this famous poem, Dufu describes meeting an old musician, once a star of the imperial court, but now, like him, a refugee in the south. Tang 哦, Changsha was a good time for him. The local governor admired his poems. They were creative people to work with. Their time here in Changsha gave the family a chance to get their feet on dry land after all those months in the boat. They celebrated the Chinese New Year, and on the 1st of February, they had the birthday of their youngest son, Little Bear. There's a sweet poem in which Du Fu describes teaching the boy about poetic composition. And most of all, they celebrated the birth of another child, a baby daughter. But then in early May, the governor, for whom Du Fu had built up a real affection, was murdered by a rival general, and the city was plunged into chaos. The family were left with no alternative but to get back in the boat and travel on upstream. As Du Fu wrote, his line of life was running to an end. He'd been driven from every place he'd made his home, and now with new tides of violence sweeping the south, he tried to take his family upriver where an uncle was an official. Heavy rains forced him to turn back. Long a sufferer from asthma and diabetes, his health collapsed. His last poem is from the winter of 770, a thousand leagues from home, as he said. Written on a sick bed in the boat, his final words are a valedictory unlike that of any other great artist. On my journey, I am sick, and time closes in on me. This watery land engulfs the simple cottages in a mist, maple shores layer green summits. Excitement gone, now nothing troubles me. My ragged clothes have been patched every inch. I've got to know the customs of all the nine regions of China and still the blood of battle flows, as it has for so long. And the sounds of armies stir to this day. I have achieved nothing, and my tears fall like rain. Du Fu died in 770, in complete obscurity, not yet 60, but old before his time. His sons had hoped to take him back to the clan cemetery near Luoyang, but with the war they couldn't. So they settled here, 
to tend his grave. But they saved the scrolls of his poems. And within a decade of his death, a selection was published to great acclaim. Since the dawn of poetry, one critic wrote, there is no one like him. And over the next two centuries, he would be acknowledged by common consent as China's greatest poet. But in a way, to call him that is to underplay his importance in Chinese culture because it limits his standing simply to that of a poet. There's no comparable figure in Western culture. Someone who, by chance, as it turned out, came to embody not only the feelings, but the moral sensibility of a whole civilization. Here at his grave near Pinjiang in Hunan, they hold a ceremony for him on the traditional day when the Chinese commemorate the ancestors, Tomb Sweeping Day. Today, every child in China learns Du Fu's words in school. The meeting with the old musician, the spring scene in the ruined capital, the dancer Lady Gong Sun, his wife standing alone in the moonlit window. They're taught about his love for the common people and also, of course, his loyalty to the state. In his ambition to save the nation through a career in government, Du Fu was a complete failure. Why Du Fu still is loved by the Chinese people? But through his poetry, he did more than any emperor to help shape the nation's values. Expressing what it means to be Chinese in the greatest words in the Chinese language. Ah, yes, yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. The great poets like Du Fu, which speak about the heart, still have something to, to teach us. Poetry was my family's business. The early writers first made poetry take wings and soar. Later ones have enriched their works. Each generation produces its own fruits. Writers stand in different ranks. A true fame, surely, is no random favor. Great literature is for a thousand ages. Whether it succeeds or not, you know in the heart.